Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Faith this morning. We are so glad that you are here on this rainy Sunday morning. We're so glad that you're watching online if you are with us uh, in the comfort of wherever you are at this moment. Um, this is a good day. Amen. Um, I, I have seen God do so many things as Pastor uh, Sam was singing there about uh, all the things that we have seen God do. We have seen God do so many things over the years. And it is so just allowing the Spirit to just bring those things back to the forefront of our mind and remind us that whatever we're struggling with right now, God is sufficient. He always has been and he always will be. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, this morning, I want to mention to you, we are still on track for April 2nd uh, to be in our new sanctuary. We are very excited about that. Um, there's one thing, uh, you know, that I want to mention in this moment is that we are in the middle of a building campaign, right? And I hope that you kind of have noticed that that's not at the forefront. There are no thermometers anywhere. Uh, there's nobody really asking for things. In fact, you might notice how low-key even the offering collection is, right? I mean, do you remember there being even an appeal? Um, but uh, just want to mention that right now, you know, we are in the final weeks uh, as you enter the final weeks of construction, it prepares the kind of transition from construction phase to like normal time, right? And this is a very key time. If you have something to give, I realize everything going on in the world, and so that's one of the reasons that we're so low-key with this. But if you can, you know, maybe your family sacrifice one meal eating out or something in a week or do something, anything that you give in these next few weeks is going to matter so much as we prepare to make that transition uh, out of the construction phase into normal normal time. So if you've uh, been thinking, praying about something to give or to contribute, um, this is the time to do it. Amen? All right. So if you guys know that stuff all makes me very uncomfortable, I don't like it. And uh, so we're talking in staff meeting and who gets to say it, I get to say it. So joy to the world. And now part two <laughs> of for better or for worse. Now, I, I'd said to you last week, and I just want to reiterate that we sort of stumbled into um, this, uh, this relationship series during the month of February. And, and, uh, and so here we are, it's February, uh, and, and we're in a relationship series, but that was not the plan, I promise you. It just kind of, that's how it uh, worked out. You can choose to believe me or not. Um, but we talked last week about the dating relationship and the importance of, of choosing uh, the right spouse, the importance of, and the ways in which how we go about doing that. If you missed last week and, and you're single, I would really encourage you to go back and listen to watch that online. Even if you're not single, there are things in every one of these messages that I think are important for our relationships and for our marriages. And uh, so I would encourage you to go back and check that out. But one thing that I think is so important as I just keep digging into this is the realization that, you know what, S stop focusing on your relationship, right? And start focusing on Jesus. And, and just more and more, I, I try, I've, been, I've listened to a, a hundred sermons, maybe that's a slight exaggeration. I've been reading about relationships, I've been doing all this stuff, and it's like there's so many tips and there's so much stuff, and oh, I'm going to do this, and oh, I'm going to do that, and some of it's good and it's solid, but you know the core of our lives, and if we want to be successful in relationships or anything that we're doing, it's following the teachings of Christ. It's following the ways of Christ. If I, as a husband, am like Christ, my marriage is going gonna, is gonna to thrive as far as I'm concerned, right? If I, as a boss, am like Christ, then, then I'm going to succeed in that role. If, as an employee, I'm like Christ, I'm going to succeed in, in that role. If not now, in eternity, right? And I'm going to understand the, those dynamics. And so I want to encourage you. You know, you, you hear me talk about relationships this month. You hear everybody talk about relationships this month, right? You know what? If, if that's overwhelming or if that's something you're not sure if you should buy into it, just go back to the red letters. Just go back and just dive into the Gospels and say, how was Jesus? And how can this inform me in being a husband or, or being a wife? And, and I think that that's so important. So this morning, we're going to get into a principle here. But for me, it's a core principle of Christianity. This is how uh, I, I believe Jesus lived his life, who Jesus would want us to be at the core of who we are, who we would want us to be. Uh, this is a message that I feel like I could almost preach in the, in, in the context of any series, whatever we were talking about. But we write now happen to be talking about building a marriage for better or for worse. And so I think that this principle very much applies in marriage because I think it applies everywhere, but I think it's something that's maybe more difficult in 
marriage. And so we want to read a few couple of scriptures here, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 27. And then we're going to look at Proverbs 22 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 19, it says this, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so also to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all means I might, have, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Proverbs 22 and 6 says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's pray together. Father, we just come into your presence today reminded of your goodness, reminded of all the blessings that we have in our lives. Uh, God, I just uh, pray for Vince Walker today that you would have your hand upon him, continue to bring healing into his body. We're thankful for the answers to all of our prayers and pray, God, that you would continue to work. God, I just pray that in these next minutes that you would speak to us. Use the message you've put in my heart, God, to encourage and strengthen your people. I believe that's why you've brought us here today, that we would be encouraged, that we would be strengthened, God, that we would understand that you desire to carry the weight as we follow after you. So lead us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Now, my wife and I, we share the same core values and beliefs um, but just about every uh, other thing about us is completely opposite. Um, I, I made a chart. Um, I have uh, affectionately named this chart the tip of the iceberg. And, uh, and, and this is just talking about the ways in which we are opposites. Michelle and I are opposites. I love to travel. I love to be on an airplane. When I see an airplane in the sky, I think, oh, I wonder where that's going. I wish I was on it, right? She loves to stay home. Uh, I, I'm a people person. I like to talk to people. I get energized. She's a task person. She likes getting stuff done and checking off the list, and that's what gives her energy. I like sci-fi and fantasy, you know, like Lord of the Rings and all that kind of stuff, and I love all of that. She wants something real. If they're buying a house or selling a house or decorating a house or anything with a house, right? It's very real. It's very tangible. She could touch it. She likes it, right? That's her thing, something real. I like poetry and symbolism, you know, oh, let's dig into it and find the meaning. She likes literal and straightforward. I don't have time to dig in it and find the meaning. If you want to tell me something, tell me, right? I am emotional, okay? And uh, it's hard to embrace that word, okay? But I do. I recognize um, I am emotional. She is very steady. For me, that's a kind way of saying it. I like words and noise and something, you know, going on in the background, and I just love being in a room full of people, and she likes silence, right? You know, in some arguments along the way, I've used the word robot. That was probably not fair, and I would just like to publicly <laughs> sort of confess <laughs> uh, right now, but I mean, we are just completely and totally opposites. I mean, we do both like sports, so tonight's going to be a, a fun night, right? Um, I see Eagles fans uh, here. I see Kansas City Chiefs fans uh, here, and so see, the peace of God rules and reigns in, in, this, uh, in this time here this morning. But we're going to really enjoy the evening um, tonight. But, you know, for the most, most part, there is a, sort of an under tension between the two of us. In fact, if you've been around us probably in a lot of settings, uh, you'll have noticed that between Michelle and I, there's sort of a tension, there's sort of a push and pull. One of our friends the other night said, I love the way you two bicker. It's cute. And I was like, I didn't realize we were bickering in that moment. You know, it was just, that's the back and forth. There have been staff meetings where, you know, we will passionately disagree, like right in front of people. And they'll get uncomfortable. I'll look around the room and everybody's face is kind of like, oh man, you know, uh, what's going on here? There are times in private when we even more passionately disagree, right? 
But there's something, you know, we've weathered many seasons of our lives and many seasons of our marriage. And, and we've come to recognize that we need one another. That we uh, give each other the ability, you know, with all of these things, all of these things swirl in the world around us, and we need the perspective of one another if we're going to be able to make good and right decisions. You know, all of these things swirl and have different combinations in our three kids, and our kids need the perspective of both of us if they're going to be healthy and if they're going to have a perspective, and if we, Michelle and I are going to make good decisions, we need one another right? And, and it's not just when we argue and when we come into those discussions, we've matured to a place where we realize it's not about her being right or me being right. It's about how can we as a couple make the best decision. It's not about are we going to get stay married, right? Or are we going to not stay married? That's what it's, it's not about that anymore. It's about how can we come together to make the best decision. And that best decision is not made by, oh, honey, whatever you want, and oh, honey, whatever you want, and oh, you know, that, that, that's not it. It's, it's we engage with one another, and we realize we're both seeking the good of the other one, and we come together with those different perspectives, and we bring it, right, fully ourselves, and we bring it. And I think so often couples don't realize that their differences are something that are complementary in their lives. You know, whenever I do premarital or marital counseling, in fact, you know, if, if you've been in premarital counseling, you know one of the first things that I put in your hand is a personality assessment, right? And uh, you can go ahead and take those down, Mark. And, and we do a personality assessment and we look at that because... For thousands of years, I mean, let me just step outside of the scriptures and then we'll jump right back in the scriptures, okay? But for thousands of years, people have recognized that there are different personalities in different people. In fact, Hippocrates, who lived from 460 to 370 BC, he's commonly regarded as the father of modern medicine. Uh, every physician takes the Hippocratic Oath, which is to first do no harm, and that's named after Hippocrates. And Hippocrates wrote over 70 books. And this is in, in this period of time when writing was very difficult. Wrote 70 books for, with, based on the scientific method and observation and trying to discern what was going on in people. And one of the things that came out of his observations was that there were four basic personality types. And modern psychology, modern research has tried to refine and, and to, dis, to, to study people. And what they've found is that, yes, there's basically four different personality um, sliders that go up and down in all of the different people, right? Now, uh, I don't want to get into the specific sliders. I don't want to get into personality assessments. But the, the thing that we need to realize is that that exists, that there's a bent inside of you that interacts with the bent inside of the people around you. And that's so true in marriage. There's a bent inside of you that interacts with the bent inside of your spouse. And the thing that attracted you to your spouse to start with was that bent. And in fact, what attracted you to your spouse to start with was the fact that they are bent opposite of you. Because you see, like, and I just, I, I don't know what better example to use. Like, I don't want to use you, any of you as an example, right? So I'm going to use Michelle and I as an example. But you know what? She's great at certain things that I'm terrible at, and I'm great at certain things that she's terrible at. And you know what? When we were dating, it was awesome. I was like, wow, you're great at these things that I'm terrible at. When I, we got married and we began to try to kill the selfishness that was within us, it became very annoying, that she was great at the things that I was terrible at. It was that she always wanted to tell me how to do these things, right? And it was like, oh, well, I loved you when we were dating because you were different, and now we're in it, and now you're nagging me all the time. And, and I'm sure if she was standing up here, she would have this, the very opposite story, right? And those opposite things attract us, and then those opposite things cause us to attack one another. I wanted two big magnets this morning, but apparently the world's broken and you can't get a magnet these days. <laughs> and you know when you put those two magnets together, like facing the right direction, what do they do? They pop together, right? But then you turn them outward, and that's what happens when you get married. You turn out on the world and you begin to, to, to engage the world. And what happens to those two magnets? They begin to push apart. But if in marriage, we continue to remember, no, the, the reason that I need you, the reason that I love you to begin with is because you have those things that I need. It turns us back to one another and, can, and reconnects us in that place. And so 
It would have, you would have oohed and awed if I had actually had the magnets. <laughs> and in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, we, we read it earlier. It says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And many of you have heard that verse. But I want to tell you, and you can do your own research. Please do your own research on this, okay, if you don't believe me. That is the wrong translation. The first English translation translated it wrong, and every English translation that has translated Proverbs 22.6 has followed suit. The real, that if you go back to the Hebrew and you look at it, the word should is not in there. And you say, well, what difference does that make? One word, it makes all the difference in the world. Train up a child in the way he goes, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The focus is not on the path, right? It's not on the way you should go. And many parents have come to me and come to us and said, listen, I've trained up my child in the way they should go, but when they got old, they depart from it. The scripture's not true. But the truth is, that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that your kids were born with a personality and that that when they get older, they're not going to depart from that personality. Train up a child in the way he goes, how is he, right? And we have, th- we have three children, and I was there for their debut. The moment they popped out into the world and said, hello, I was there. And in that delivery room, each and every one of them had their personalities already set. The way that they dealt with the nurses, the way that they cried, the way that they dealt with the fact that just a minute ago they were warm and cozy, and now it's bright and cold. The way they dealt with all of those things was, the, was right there in the delivery room. And I could see it, and we can all tell stories about it, and we know, we recognize, yes, they have a bent. But, Pastor, I thought we were talking about marriage, not parenting. We are talking about marriage. Because, you see, your spouse made their debut one day in a delivery room somewhere. And when they popped out, they had a personality, a bent. And guess what? That personality and bent is not going to change. It's probably opposite of yours. Right? Because we just talked about why. And listen, God brought you two together to complete one another, but instead we fight to mold our spouse into our image. God brought you and your spouse together to complete one another, and instead we fight to mold our spouse into our image. This is not the way of Jesus. This is not how Jesus commands us to live our lives, and it's not how he would have us to be married. Your spouse has a bent that God gave them and sewn into them when he formed them in their mother's womb. We can't change that. We, we, we co- we're there with them according to that. You have a bent, right? A, a personality, a way that you process the world. And, and that is not going to change. The scriptures show us that over and over. It's not going to change. We need to have peace with that. And we need to find a way to pursue God together with the bent that we have. Listen, if you're trying to mold your spouse into your own image, that's a sin. I don't know how to say it any more plain than that. Your desire is that your spouse would be in the image of God, not in your image. You know, we see this so present in the Gospels. In fact, we see it present in the structure of the Gospels, these different types of personalities. I told you that Hippocrates recognized four different basic bents. And if you look, Myers-Briggs, disc, four Greek words, which are actually Hippocrates' words, the different animals, there are colors. When you look at it and you can get down to it, there's basically four different personality sliders, right? And they say, well, if you're way down, you're this letter. And if you're way up, you're this letter. And if you're down or whatever, there's four different ones. How many gospels are there? Four. And if you read those Gospels, you see, right, that they're written from four different perspectives. The book of Matthew is very authoritative and strong and says this is, Jesus is the king and this is the kingdom of God. Mark is written in a hurried pace. In fact, the word in Mark is immediately, and you move through it, and it's so short, and he doesn't want to cherry all the details. He just wants you to get excited with him about the story. And Luke has so many details that he sat down to write one book, and what did he do? He wrote two books, right? You all know that person. Don't ask them, right? You're going to get way more information than you ever wanted, right? You know that person. John sits down and writes his book, and he, 
he, you could just hear his love for Jesus to the point where he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And you say, well, that sounds kind of arrogant. It's not. It's relational, right? I was in a relationship with this guy, and, and, and we loved each other. And we see that those are four different perspectives right there in the Gospels, right? And you say, well, Pastor, you're saying that's why they were written that way? I don't know. I can't say that. We get to heaven. We ask God questions, you know. But I, we, we see it there. And if you jump into those Gospels and you begin to read those Gospels, you see how Jesus interacted with people. If you look and, and read those stories, you'll see when Jesus walks into a situation, it's hard to even tell what Jesus' real bent was because his bent always changes based on the bent of the people that he's talking to. He comes into a situation and he speaks to people on their level and where they are to the point where they, they, they love him or dislike him, but he always speaks to them based on who they are. I think one of the stories in which this is the most clear is when Lazarus dies and Jesus comes back to Martha and Mary. Watch Jesus' interaction here in, in John chapter 11 with Martha. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you, have been, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Martha, and we know her from, from the other stories in the scriptures, she is a very task-oriented person, a very facts-based person. And when she encounters Jesus, what does she say? She begins stating facts. And what does Jesus do? He begins to state facts back to her. Now watch when Jesus met Mary. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Where did we hear that before? It's exactly what Martha said, Right? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept. Martha questions. Martha, the busy one, right? The one that's always like, hey, we're doing, and, and questions and all this, and, and Jesus gives her answers. Martha, Mary comes. She, at first, she can't even come out to see him because she's emotional, right? She comes to him. She's weeping, and she's crying, and what does Jesus do in response Everybody's favorite Bible verse to memorize, Jesus wept. Martha, and, and just, to, you know, they, they kind of go down, and Martha's still stating facts. She says to Jesus, um, Jesus like, we're going to roll that stone away. And Martha's like, um, Lord, he's going to stink by now. <laughs> Thank you for the facts, Martha. Thank you for just keep, just keep the facts rolling, Martha, right? I'm going to do my thing now. Is that all right, Martha? Yes, Lord, yes. Do your thing. Peter comes to Jesus and questions Jesus and has all these, these ideas about what Jesus did you. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. That's hard, man. I mean, I just really hope, you know, Jesus never says something like that to me or you, right? Get behind me, Satan. John and James come to Jesus and, and they have a suggestion on how Jesus should do, should do things. And what does Jesus say? Jesus basically says to them, knock it off. And if you've ever, if you're a parent of multiple children, you understand there are some kids that you got to tell them, right, and you got to put the fear of God in them. And there's other kids that you just look at disappointedly, and they snap too. But when we see that in Jesus' life, and then what does Paul say? Paul says in the verse that we read, he comes and he says, you know what? I encountered these uneducated people, so I spoke in a way that was uneducated. I encountered the educated people, so I spoke with all the big words. I encountered the formal people, and I responded in a formal way. And I, and I came to just the common people, and I responded in a common way, right? He says, I, I encountered religious people, and so I spoke to them like religious people. And when I encountered non-religious people, I spoke to them without any of the religious jargon. And I just spoke to them plainly. What did he do? It's like, I come into every situation and I'm sensitive to what? Not my needs, not my personality needs, not who I am, not what I need to, to be chief. What I do is I respond to the people that I'm speaking to. The same thing that we see in Jesus, we see in Paul. And then what does Jude say in Jude 1, 22 to 23? Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. 
It's like right there, be discerning in that situation. Some people, grab them, take them, be bold with them, right? Other people, you got to speak gently and you got to be kind. What do we see all throughout the scriptures? What do we see? It's a response to not my needs. What I see is a response to the needs of those around me and the bent of those around them. How many times do we walk into a situation and we demand that people do things according to my bent? I walk into a restaurant to order my food and I demand that the waitress and the waiter and the staff and everybody do things according to my way of doing them. I walk into work and I demand that everyone do things according to my way of doing them. I walk into my marriage and I demand that my spouse does everything in accordance with my way of doing it. But that's not the way of Christ. The way of Christ says, I am not here to change your bent. Paul, 1 Corinthians 2 and 2 says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 6, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the other rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Ah. If my life is about getting my way, if my marriage is about getting my way, then that is not the way of Christ. That is not the way of the Bible. The Bible says, I resolve to know nothing but Christ crucified. I want at the end of our marriage, when, when we're standing before God and I'm standing before God to give an account, I want nothing but Michelle's life to, to have matured and grown into the image of Christ, not my image. I, for all of eternity, it's got, not going to matter how I like things. And when we walk into work and when we walk into the places and when we demand that things be bent according to our bent, why people don't care what we say about Christ. We can, in our mannerisms, uh, just uh, put a distance between us right when we walk in the door. And when we do that every day when we walk into our marriage and we say, oh, well, you're going to be bent like I'm bent every single day in little subtle ways with little subtle words and our demeanor is that going to lead to a marriage that will last for better or for worse? It is an ungodly and cultural expression of marriage that my spouse is there to meet all my needs. I am there to be a servant of Christ. And if none of my needs get met, then guess what? That's not going to change because I'm going to give an account not to Michelle at the end of days, but to God in heaven. Don't hear me talking about abuse. Don't hear me talking about situations where you're in danger. Don't hear me talking about that. But also don't invoke those situations to excuse us from everyday behaviors where we're just trying to bend our spouse to our will. It's not the way that God would have us to live. If you're single and you missed last week's message, I want to really encourage you to go back and listen to it. Because this is why that message matters so much. Because when you make a choice of a spouse, you're choosing someone that you are called to serve. That you're not called to reshape and to remold, but you're called to serve them. So if you choose wrongly, then your needs are not going to be met. Because you need to choose a spouse who is seeking after God and can hear from God and God can shape them and mold them and they will hear the call on their life to serve you. But if they don't, it's no excuse. It's no excuse for you and me. So when you make that decision and the people around you, they're leaning on you and the people around you are pressuring you and they're saying, oh, we need to, this needs to be a good decision. This needs to be a good decision. It's because we know that when you enter into that covenant, 
that you're called to serve. And that is an important decision in your life. I wonder if this morning we could take just a minute and do some evaluating and maybe do some repenting, at least beginning this process of saying, where am I walking in and asking people to be bent like I'm bent? Where am I walking in and trying to shape people into my image? Is that present in my marriage? Is it present at work? Is it present in my daily interactions? Can we ask the Lord to reveal that and to lead us? God, we just come to you in this moment. And the confession of our heart, God, is that we desire to be like Jesus. He is our role model. He is our Lord. He is our example. Lord, shape us and mold us in so that we can conform to the image of our Savior. And Lord, we recognize that part of that, God, part of being crucified daily means that, God, I set aside my bent and preferences and I try to serve those people around me. And God, that begins in my home. It begins in my bedroom with my spouse. How can I serve Michelle more effectively, God? How can I be a better husband? God, lead me. God, lead us. Help us, God. This is hard stuff. I don't want to be crucified. I want off the cross. But Lord, I also want to be conformed to your image. So help me, God. Lead us, God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand together. Our prayer team is coming right now, and if you have a need that you would like to pray about, I just want to encourage you to come and to meet with them. If you're online this morning and and have a prayer need, I would encourage you to just say something to the chat host. They can take you into a private chat place where not everybody will see what you're talking about and praying about. We would love to pray with you this morning. But even as everybody goes that way, you're welcome to come this way if you want to pray. But just like so many of the things that the Lord convicts us with, you know, these are things that can't be really dealt with effectively on a Sunday morning. You gotta walk out of here and make a decision. Am I gonna be like Jesus or am I just gonna continue to be like me? Lord, I pray your blessing on your people as they go from this place. Would you give them a peace that passes understanding, a peace that is so strong in their lives that people around them take notice and they come and they say, what's different about you? You seem so grounded. You seem to have peace even when things are kind of shaking around you. And our answer will be, it's Jesus. Jesus has given me hope. He's grounded me. I know that my my life is secure and that my eternity is secure. So I have a peace that just can't be shaken. I thank you for this peace and I pray this blessing on your people now in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace be with you.